Hello, everyone. I am Allie Katz. I'm the program coordinator at the Kelly Writers House, and I'm so excited uh, that tonight Anthony De Curtis is going to be in conversation with Holly George Warren. They're going to talk about uh, Holly George Warren's great book about Janis Joplin and about art writing and all that awesome stuff. And I just want to thank Anthony. Uh, he did such an amazing job with the Real Arts program of of bringing uh, people working in the arts and then doing the work in the arts uh, to the writer's house, both physically and now virtually. So uh, thank you, Anthony. And thank you, Holly, for joining us. Uh, so welcome. And uh, there'll be a link to buy Holly's book and to sign our guest book and all of that. And during this conversation, if you have any questions for Anthony or Holly, you can drop it in the YouTube chat and that will get to them. So thank you all and uh, enjoy the conversation. Uh, Thank thanks, Allie. Uh, it's actually so great to see you. I mean, I can't wait to, to be back on campus and uh, be able to like hang a little bit. Um, but I am excited to um, welcome Holly to our virtual home. Uh, Holly and I have been friends for quite some time, uh, you know, and, and she's somebody that is um, it just, I mean, well, this book is, a, is quite an achievement. Um, in such an impressive uh, biography of Janis Joplin. I mean, obviously, a, a lot of writing had, um, you know, been done on Janis. And, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, I want to discuss with Holly today. But, you know, she took a much deeper and broader uh, approach to who Janis Joplin was and just like reconfigured you know, certainly my thinking uh, about, um, you know, who she was and, you know, on the strength of the reviews, the thinking of many other people as well. Um, Holly also has done biographies of Alex Chilton and Jean Autry. And she's been a writer for Rolling Stone and many other publications. Uh, she and I worked together as editors on the Rolling Stone album guide and uh, the um, uh, the, the Rolling Stone illustrated history of rock and roll. And it was such a chore that working, that, that having the opportunity to work so closely with Holly was, uh, was really just about the only thing that made it worthwhile. That and the actual product that we produced, which, uh, you know, I'm very proud of to this day. But Holly, um, it's so great to have you. We only wish it could be in person. Thank you, Anthony, so much for inviting me today. And I was just doing the math while you were talking, and it's kind of scary. We're talking 30 years ago. No, I was thinking it is 30 years. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And I have to say that was working together in the trenches on those projects around the clock, it seemed like, um, was an amazing way to bond a friendship. And then also I've, I tell everyone who ever asked about, do you have mentors? And I always point to Anthony De Curtis as being a real mentor to me and actually, you know, working together, just uh, your professional standards and knowledge of music were just mind blowing. But the way that you actually really, you know, one on one would um, look at my writing and uh, talk about it with me and discuss it with me and give me all kinds of suggestions and um, in a way that was very empowering rather than like, oh, I can't write, you know. So I, I'm just saying to all those students of yours that are watching, you're very, very lucky because you have the best. Oh, um, God, Holly, you're so kind. Um, well, <laughs> well, look, I've, you know, I've just been praising wildly and, and I mean, not only today, but to, to many other people as well, uh, you know, this uh, biography of Janis Joplin. Um, I'd love it if you could like read a bit for us and give everybody a taste before we dove in because, um, you know, I want to I want people to hear like the level that you're working at. Uh, so you have something you'd like to. to... Yeah, I, I thought today, since we sadly we're speaking via Zoom to take us back to those heady days when we actually were packed into clubs. Uh, and we're all sweaty and listening to live bands play for us. <laughs> I thought I would go back to those kind of times because um, those were the times that, of course, Janis Joplin loved 
Um, she started out playing in small little clubs, um, Thread Gills in Austin, Texas, which sadly just closed down last year, um, was where she first started performing for audiences and people would pack in to see her in this little beer joint. And her favorite places to perform were in, um, you know, not fancy theaters, but these uh, ballrooms, as they were called in the 60s in San Francisco, when she went to San Francisco and joined Big Brother and the Holding Company in 1966. And just that um, energy that she got from her audiences, I think really you know, helped her up her game and become the amazing performer that she was. So I thought I would just kick off, um, you know, with a little reading from the beginning of the book, just to kind of set the scene for who Janice was and uh, what she has done for us and our culture. <clears throat> it's a steamy September night in Nashville and Ruby Boots is tearing it up on stage at the basement East thrashing her electric guitar and belting Janis Joplin's Peace of My Heart. The 2018 edition of the Six Day Americana Fest, an annual music conference and festival, is honoring albums from 1968, and Big Brother and the Holding Company's breakthrough, Cheap Thrills, has made the cut. Ruby Boots, born Bex Chilcott in Perth, Australia, fell in love with Janice's music as a kid growing up on the other side of the world. The irresistible, aching soul in Janice's voice undiminished by time, distance, and even mortality. As when Janice herself unleashed this tune 50-some years ago, the crowd, wired into its raw but fearless humanity, pushes toward the stage. At the Americana Honors and Music Awards show held at the Ryman Auditorium, former home of the Grand Ole Opry, numerous Janice acolytes take the stage. Singer-songwriter activist Roseanne Cash, a Janice fan since her teens, wins the Free Speech and Music Award. Alberta, Canada native Katie Lang, who went public as a lesbian in 1991, gets the Trailblazer Award. Formidable singers Brandi Carlisle, Margot Price, Courtney Marie Andrews, all nominees for various honors, signal Janice's influence in their blazing performances. Prior to Janice Joplin's all too brief time in the spotlight, these artists would have been hard pressed to find a female role model to compare with the beatnik from Port Arthur, Texas. The mix of confident musicianship brash sexuality and natural exuberance locked together to produce America's first female rock star changed everything. As such, Janice still holds sway over multiple generations, artists of countless genres across the gender spectrum. And although her bookishness, sharp intellect and deep desire for home with the requisite white picket fence were not at the forefront of the identity she crafted for her fans, those parts of her also informed her every move. The same could be said of her pioneering instincts. While Janice's era is largely considered a time of release from the strictures of the 1950s, rock was in fact almost exclusively a boys club and Janice suffered appalling sexism, both from the mainstream and counterculture press, and cold, occasionally cruel dismissiveness from industry pros. Yet she blazed on. Through force of will and unprecedented talent, she showed how rock could include unapologetic women musicians, writers, and fans. Feminist Ellen Willis, a New, York, New Yorker music critic in the 1960s, called Janice, quote, the only 60 culture hero to make visible and public women's experience of the quest for individual liberation, end quote. Patti Smith, Blondie's Debbie Harry, Cindy Lauper, Chrissy Hine, the B-52's Kate Pearson, and Hart's Anne and Nancy Wilson are among the artists who experienced Janice firsthand they began to breathe in the possibility of their own futures. When Stevie Nicks was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in March 2019, she said that playing on a bill with Janice in the 1960s transformed her. Quote, her connection with the audience was so incredible that I said, I want to do what she did, end quote. 
Through her influence and her own enduring work, Janis Joplin remains at the core of our music and culture. As we look back at pivotal moments in 1960s rock history, she is usually there. The Monterey Pop Festival, the vibrant Haight-Ashbury scene in San Francisco, the streets, clubs, and studios of gritty New York City, Woodstock. She's been feted at museum exhibitions and the subject of theater productions and films. Her first solo album, the eclectic daring departure, I got them old cosmic blues again, mama, sounds as fresh today as upon its 1969 release. Her Monterey pop performance documented by the late filmmaker D.A. Pennebaker still brings wild applause from a new generation of audiences at screenings and with YouTube views in the millions and counting. When Janice hit the Monterey pop stage in June, 1967, few outside San Francisco knew her name. What is this girl all about? Monterey co-producer Lou Adler wondered, where did she come from looking like that and leading this all male band? Offering a clue, Haight Ashbury impresario Chet Helms introduced her on stage, quote, three or four years ago on one of my perennial hitchhikes across the country, I ran into a chick from Texas by the name of Janice Joplin, he told the unsuspecting crowd. I heard her sing and Janice and I hitched to the West Coast. A lot of things have gone down since then, but it gives me a lot of pride today to present the finished product, Big Brother and the Holding Company. Janice's astonishing performance that day would change her life and the future of popular music. By the time the five song set ended with her dramatic reinvention of R&B blues singer Willie Mae Thornton's Ball and Chain, thousands of mind blown fans and hundreds of dazzled journalists knew her name and fervently spread the news. Her emotion drenched vocal style took hold upon other developing singers, Led Zeppelin's Robert Plant among them. Young women who saw her on stage at the Avalon Ballroom or Bill Graham's Fillmore venues still recall the experience. It was like she was singing to or for them, telling their stories, feeling their pain, emboldening them and absolving them of shame. Janice was a walking live nerve, capable of surfacing feelings that most people couldn't or wouldn't, and she was willing to endure the toll it took on her. Janice never compromised her vision. She wasn't afraid to cross boundaries, musical, cultural, and sexual. Openly bisexual in an era when it was illegal, she was not afraid of jail, of judgment. Similarly, when critics and fans expressed umbrage at her audacity to quit her role as a chick singer in a band that she felt was holding her back, she did it anyway. Just four days before her death, on October 4th, 1970, she told journalist Howard Smith, quote, you're only as much as you settle for, end quote. Janice never settled. The oldest child of a close-knit family, she adored her father, a Bach-loving secret intellectual and a closet atheist in a conservative oil town, no less. Preteen Janice was a rambunctious tomboy who was also cerebral, curious, and a gifted visual artist, which her parents encouraged. When she reached high school, the 1950s were in full swing, and her embrace of the beat generation and of progressive racial views alienated her from her community. Janice's first transgressive act was to be a white girl who gained an early sense of the power of the blues, chasing that music in Gulf Coast saloons and on obscure records. She never fully recovered from the intense scorn of her peers, who also ridiculed her appearance, especially after she patterned herself on beatnik girls she'd seen in Life magazine. Seth and Dorothy Joplin doted on their eldest child in many ways but were ultimately put off by her increasing acts of defiance, the same impulses that would eventually bring her fame. Always an attention hungry rebel, Janice upped her game in adolescence, spurred on by her budding sexuality, her discovery of rock and roll and alcohol and speed. The wounds inflicted from the clash of wills during those turbulent years in the Joplin home 
never healed. Much of her life would be colored by the tension of wanting to belong and getting the attention she missed while knowing that the best way to honor her family's unspoken creed of singularity was to set herself apart. Discovering her outsized voice helped her find a place to fit in and create a new family. The Bohemians and musicians, first in Port Arthur and Beaumont, Texas, and then Austin, and finally San Francisco. She embraced life with a joyous ferocity though she could never escape a fundamental darkness created by loneliness and a bleak fatalism bequeathed by her father. Choosing alcohol and drugs as painkillers only just made everything worse. A passionate erudite musician, Janice was born with talent, but also worked hard to develop it, though she would omit this striving toward excellence from her origin story. When you hear outtakes of her in the studio recording what would be her final album, Pearl, she's taking the reins, running the show. During a period when women did not produce their own music, she collaborated fully with her notoriously iron-fisted producer, Paul Rothschild. These sessions were a time of artistic blossoming for Janice. Her ideas, along with her extraordinary voice, and her simpatico full tilt boogie band resulted in a ma masterpiece. <clears throat> After Janice's accidental heroin overdose in 1970, at the age of 27, the posthumously released Pearl, which came out 50 years ago last month, it's hard to believe, um, would become her most successful and enduring album with its single, Me and Bobby McGee, the end piece to a career that started with Peace of My Heart. Janis Joplin's distinctive voice sounds as powerful today as it did when introduced on the airwaves in 1967. More so than any of her peers, it cuts through the digital din, the noise of our age, and lands exactly where Janis wanted, deep inside the heart. Since her time, her work and life have inspired so many women to create their own sounds and with their own uncompromising paths, from Lucinda Williams to Pink, Amy Winehouse to Carolyn Wonderland, Lady Gaga to Brittany Howard, Alicia Keys to Florence Welch, Grace Potter to Elle King, Melissa Etheridge to Kesha. Lucinda Williams has written a song about her, Port Arthur. Pink helped to wanted to play her in a film. Wonderland does a killer version of a 1962 Janice original, What Good Can Drinkin' Do, one of my faves. And Etheridge helped induct her into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame back in 1995. That night, Etheridge said, quote, when a soul can look on the world and see and feel the pain and loneliness and can reach deep down inside and find a voice to sing of it, a soul can heal, end quote. Perhaps that remains Janice's greatest gift. Perhaps that's why we have been listening to a lot of Janice in these times we live in too, I think. For sure. Well, thank you, Holly. I mean, that was just terrific. Um, you know, I want to sort of come in on, on a kind of maybe untypical angle, but as you were reading, something occurred to me, you know, I watched um, this week, the documentary about Bobby Keys that um, was done in, in, in 2019. And uh, Bobby Keys, of course, uh, for those of you who may not know, is a very well-known sax player, you know, played with the Rolling Stones uh, primarily, but, you know, played also with, uh, you know, John Lennon and uh, he, uh, uh, George Harrison and, uh, Delaney and Bonnie. Anyway, he also is from Texas, uh, from Lubbock. And, um, you know, he, you know, had, you know, we, we talked in the documentary about um, people in his town hating rock and roll and like really making it clear to him. And he just knew like, you know, I've got to get out. And then after, you know, you know, he ended up returning there after touring the world with the Rolling Stones, you know, 
you know, issues with drugs and everything and went back home, you know, and then picked things up again. Anyway, you know, on the 50th anniversary of his high school graduation, uh, this friend of his described that Bobby Keys, um, you know, he would think again, you know, it, it done all this amazing stuff, uh, drove to the school Slayton, S-L-A-T-O-N high school. Uh, and sort of drove to the, drove to the school and just sat in his car, like, and couldn't bring himself to go inside to, to, uh, to see these people who he felt had judged him and that he somehow still wanted validation from, you know, and it, it's, um, it was sad to hear that. And, you know, you're, you're mentioning that element of, of Janice. And of course it's well documented in the book. Um, I wonder, you know, I mean, you don't want to make some kind of wild generalization, but is there's something about, you know, like, I don't know, Texas or these towns where they grew up that maybe, you know, just kind of encouraged, uh, you know, that, that unfortunate feeling. Yeah, well, I think, you know, conservatism um, is part of that and fear of, of people who are different, etc. cetera. Um, that could be part of it. But I'm happy to report that even though Janice had those problems in a big way with Port Arthur, um, just over one year ago, I was actually in Port Arthur with Janice's brother, Michael, 10 years younger than Janice. And I did an event at the Museum of the Gulf Coast, a very cool museum that honors um, Janice and other musicians, but also artists like Robert Rauschenberg from Port Arthur, um, oh. you know, some film stars from Port Arthur, you know, and then also just the whole history of that area of the Gulf Coast, which is fascinating. Buddy Holly, too, yeah? Well, Buddy Holly's from Lubbock, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, and in oh, fact, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I think, in fact, I think Buddy himself had some bad reception from his hometown when he went from country music to rock and roll, as I recall. But anyway, um, Anthony, what was incredible for me, and and I have to say, I was a little nervous about what the reception would be like because Janice was very, um, you know, open about her. Uh, disdain for uh, some of the uh, racism that she had encountered growing up in Port in Port Arthur and all that, but I got there and I was shocked. There was literally a line around the block. I mean, something like two or three hundred people turned out to just do get their books signed. They'd all purchased wow. Janice's biography, but the best part about it, Anthony, was that times have changed and. I just couldn't help but think like, oh, my God, if Janice Joplin is looking down, she would be jumping up and down the mix of people in this crowd. I mean, it was people of all ages, all backgrounds. Um, there were uh, transgender people. There were um, black people, um, Hispanic people. Um, there were gay couples, um, you know, you know, one guy buying, you know, a copy for getting a copy signed for his husband, lesbian couple. I mean, it was just so such a rainbow of people. And and again, there were people in their late nineties who knew Janice's family there. And wow. then people with their children and grandchildren. So I think fortunately and and like I said, this was just over a year ago in um January of twenty twenty. So um you know, I think there has been some change and I think that it's it's really awful that it's taken this many years uh, for it to happen in, in places that are very conservative and not open to uh, free thinking people and people with so much self-expression, both in their art and in their lifestyle as Janice and say Bobby Keys. But I, I think things have changed to an extent, luckily. But interestingly, when you look back to the time when Janice and Bobby Keys were coming of age in Texas, um, Chet Helms actually, um, I got to see him give a talk at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when there was a symposium honoring Janice uh, back in the 90s, I believe that was. And um, he said that, that so many creative people in his theory come out of Texas because they are so squashed down, you know, because it is so conservative. And so they have to, 
you know, let their freak flag fly, so to speak, to um, find self-actualization. And, you know, they have to leave Texas in order to do that. But by being in that kind of vacuum there gives them the room for all this art, artistry and creativity sure. and self reinvention. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, if you're in a place where everybody is patting you on the back, maybe, and saying, oh, yeah, you know, doing what you're doing is cool, you know, maybe <laughs> you wouldn't have anything to rebel against or whatever. So, you know, who knows? But it's kind of a fascinating thing to think about. What, you know, when you set out to, um, you know, do this book, you know, obviously there had been books about Janice, you know, but what did you feel like was missing and that you, you know, would be able to, you know, bring uh, to her story? And, you know, tell us about like a couple of, um, you know, kind of interesting discoveries that you made in the course of your research. Well, you know, I, I was a fan. I discovered Pearl when I was about uh, 14, I guess. I think I'd already seen her on the Dick Cavett show. I've been blown away by her intellect and her get up. I loved, I loved her whole like uh, look that she came up with. And growing up in a small town in the South myself, I grew up in a very conservative um, little town and, you know, was a, in a dry county and <laughs> very, um, you know, a lot of churches in my hometown. So Janice was not popular in my town, but I think I saw her on the Dick Cavett show and was like, wow, what is that? But um, I read Myra Friedman's biography of Janice Buried Alive um, when it came out in the mid seventies. And it really kind of um, stayed with me and it affected my thinking about uh, what Janice, who Janice was. And that was that Janice was a self-destructive victim who, you know, had a great voice, but was on her own worst enemy and was basically on this downward spiral. And then so she OD'd and died. And, you know, it, I also just from reading articles over the years and various uh, rock magazines and things like that, um, it kind of confirmed that idea of Janice as victim, Janice as martyr even, um, Janice as someone who was just this big bundle of emotion, just put herself out there and just sang her hearts out until she died from killing herself from the way she lived and sang. And, you know, Janice actually, to be honest with you, kind of propelled that idea of that, you know, oh man, I'm just out there feeling the blues, you know, and uh, I just woke up one day and I could say, and it turns out that, you know, Janice herself did create a persona and I guess she did a good job because everybody bought it and then kind of subserviated her power and authority into this, you know, um, passive, you know, person who death came to when in reality, what I discovered through my research and getting to meet and interview a lot of musicians and people that she, people she came up with in Port Arthur, reading letters that she wrote as a teenager um, and young woman. And I saw, wait a minute, that was not Janis Joplin. Um, this person was driven. She was ambitious. She, you know, wanted to be a, a fine, a visual artist at first, but then when she discovered her voice and what she could do with that voice, both for herself, that she could use that voice to tap into those feelings of pain and loneliness and abandonment and shame, etc. She could use it to kind of um, exercise some of those feelings, but then it also was able to help other people exercise their own feelings. And then they loved her. They were pouring back this, you know, like energy to her that it was just became this incredible thing for her. And she never wanted to rest on her discoveries of what she could do. She always wanted to push forward. She always wanted to continue. I mean, I think that's why she quit Big Brother and the Holding Company was she wanted to try other kinds of music. And then that's when she you know, put behind her next band and started, you know, started anew. I mean, I think she would have continued to do that. She just had this very um, strong drive to create, to um, evolve, to discover new things that she could do with her music, with her vision. And um, I think a lot of that, you know, that got lost in the translation of, of the telling of Janice's story over the years. And when I made those discoveries, that's what I really wanted to bring back. And I wanted to, I thought it was fascinating just, you know, how this young 
girl living in a segregated town in the 50s was able to seek out and find this at that time very hard to find out of print you know blue 78s and like literally study that music she became a scholar of the blues which was very unusual at that time and that same kind of uh scholarly um approach and drive to learn about it then she you know worked on her voice worked on songwriting and she never quit working to perfect her her musicianship she was taking piano lessons when she died you know um she as i mentioned in in my reading at that time it was very rare even for male artists to produce themselves but she had such a head technical head for the studio which you know, it's very different from the musicianship you convey when you're out on stage. It's a totally different ball of wax sitting in the studio for, you know, 15 hours listening to mixes and picking the, you know, all that kind of stuff. And she loved that. She wrote, she wrote letters about studio work and the fact that I think she really would have been one of our first uh, female producers, which we still don't have enough of even today. Um, it just was really eye-opening to me. So that's that was kind of my goal for the book. Why don't you talk a little bit about biography? I mean, since, you know, you've done uh, three and may soon be doing another. Uh, yes. What, uh, what, uh, you know, what constitutes a, 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 what are the challenges of writing a biography? You know, what constitutes, um, you know, in your view, both as a reader and as a writer, you know, a, a great biography? Um, well, again, it goes back to my childhood, just like my love of Janice. I loved biographies. I started reading them in like third grade or something. I literally would have a competition with my best friend in elementary school, like keeping a list of all the biographies we read and who could read the most. And I just, I think something about um, understanding the lives of people that have achieved in this world who have been able to direct their lives in a way to make a difference um, is, is something that just fascinates me. And I, you know, I love history, I love research, and I love storytelling. So with biography, you get kind of all of that. And, you know, my favorite biographies are the ones that kind of read almost like a novel because, um, the subject of the biography is so fascinating. And even though because they're a historical figure, you probably know what's going to happen. You know the ending horribly. But <laughs> unlike a novel, unless you sneak and re read ahead. But still, though, the path to get there can be so surprising and so many interesting twists and turns that you're like, wow. And especially when you do know a bit about the person or a fan of the person or interest in the person, you're very curious about how certain things came about. So I guess those are the reasons. Um, the challenges are, it's you feel, at least for me as a biographer, I feel such a responsibility to my subject to try to get it right. Um, you know, Anthony, even before I met you, when we worked on those Rolling Stone Press books together as editors, co-editors. You know, my first ever job at Rolling Stone was not soon after, it was pretty soon after I moved to New York City, after graduating college from North Carolina. And I was a fact checker on the very first encyclopedia of Rolling Stone back in the early 80s. And learning um, the importance of being accurate, especially in such a, a myth myth-making um, genres, rock and roll history, it's not that easy. I mean, it's it's a challenge to separate myth from uh, accurate truth. And, um, but I realized how important it is to try to get that straight. So with biographies, oh my gosh, I mean, you know, uh, a lot of people never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Um, people's memory, all that can be such a challenge. You can interview someone who was in the room with three different people. They all witnessed the same thing and all three of them remember it totally differently. You right. know? Right. I mean, I, you've, I'm sure you've found that with your own memories when you are certain about something and then you're talking to someone, you know, like, oh my God, no, I was totally yeah. wrong about yeah. it. Completely. So to be able to get all those kind of little crazy facts straight to be fascinated by the subject and do all this tons of research, but then make the editorial decisions of what to include and what to leave on the cutting room floor. So you aren't just a train spotter, you know, spouting, you know, 
you're not turning your book into a data dump, as one of my editors called one of my first drafts. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Um, you know, just being able to work, weave together all these elements and then actually, you know, have a story arc, you know, uh, tell a, an interesting story and for it to all work together thematically. I mean, it's, it's definitely a big, a big fat puzzle that's really hard to solve, but it's, it's a, a challenge that's, you feel great when it's over, when you're in the middle of it, you're, think you're going to not, you're going to jump off the ledge maybe. <laughs> yeah. No, it feels like swimming across the ocean. You know, from Lou Reed. And it's so interesting. I mean, I, Anthony, I read your Lou Reed biography as I was working on Janice. And um, it was so helpful to me because you would never think of two people being more dissimilar. But there were actually certain things about Lou Reed's life and sensibility that really uh, struck home to me trying to understand Janice and her challenges and her life and her work. Um, and the way that you pulled together certain aspects to tell this really fascinating story was, you know, very helpful to me as I was working on telling Janice's story. So thank you. Well, about Lou, I mean, I really felt like there was a way, uh, the challenge to me was like, it seemed to me there were two distinct parts to his story and weaving them together without reducing them, without saying, you know, letting them both stand and have their integrity um, while not just doing well. And then there's this part and then there's that part. I mean, that was the trick, you know, and I was thinking about that in terms of, um, uh, you know, in terms of Janice Joplin, you know, reading your book, you know, the, the idea that, you know, the image of her, that the wild hippie girl and out in San Francisco and she's got the boa on and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, at the same time, you know, there is this kind of picket fence side to her that, that you mentioned and, um, you know, the complexity of her relationship with her father, you know, and, um, you know, getting into all that and, um, letting, again, letting both of those things stand because in a sense they were both true. They were simultaneously true. They were both true at the same moment. They were both true at the very moments when they seemed to be contradicting each other, you know, and that to me, I thought like it was sort of, you know, really adept the way that you managed to, to do that. And I wonder if you can, you know, sort of talk about like those elements of her personality and, and, you know, the, uh, you know, the effort to sort of like pull all that together into a coherent story. Well, thank you, Anthony. I don't know if, you know, you found it to be this way, but um, I always am very reticent to, you know, psychoanalyze my subject. And, you know, I, I it's hard for me to try to do that. And I, I think, um, you know, my again, my editor really pushed me to try to analyze you know, who Janice was um, and try to kind of understand her interior life as well as her exterior. Um, I think one thing that helped me finally be able to do that was to think, well, you know what, in reality, she was still evolving. I mean, she was only 27 years old when she died. So who knows how she would have continued to evolve and change um, if one side would have one out more than the other, et cetera. So I kind of let myself off the hook thinking like, well, this, I think I can call, you know, come up with some ideas about how she was up until, you know, she died. So without, you know, for you, I mean, you, Lou ended up fortunately living a very long life. So I think it would have, you know, maybe in a sense, you, you could report how keep things kept changing with him. So you could finally kind of make sense of this road that he was on um as he ended up the way he did with the life that he chose etc but um with janice you know she was life interrupted so that that made it kind of tricky too um to make you know to figure that part out and luckily uh one thing that really helped me was um having access to all these letters that janice wrote to different people, um, you know, because of course you're going to write one thing to your family, another to your lover, another to your best girlfriend, etc. So by being able to read um, these incredibly well-written 
lively, thoughtful letters that she wrote was a huge help too in understanding who she was and kind of what made her tick. Yeah, I mean, that is one thing that really comes through in the book um, is, you know, this kind of, um, kind of seriousness of intellect you know, that's going on with her, you know, like that, you know, again, because, it, you know, partly I, I, as a result of her self-presentation, but also, you know, I think, you know, certain kinds of cliches about you know, the wild woman on the scene, you know, that, you know, that there was so much of a tendency to treat her exclusively in emotional terms. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. This natural talent and, you know, like a very gifted singer, obviously, um, you know, but like, you know, you really present her as, you know, someone who's behind the wheel of, of her life and her career. You know, and not only in a in a pragmatic way, but but intellectually, in terms of her conception of it. Um, you know, were you surprised by that, or were you um, did you anticipate that? Well, you know, I I remember. I mean, maybe I'm like overthinking it now or whatever. Um, but I I mean, I remember even my first. Like I said, sing her own Dick Cavett. I mean, you could tell this woman had intellect, you know, no matter what her persona was that she presented and et cetera. Um, and also just some of the footage that you could, could go back and look at of her giving interviews and things like that. You could tell, I mean, you know, this woman was sharp and well-read and intellectually sophisticated and um, a deep, deep, deep thinker. But, you know, what's horrible is the way our culture was during her lifetime, which did not approve women being that way, you know. Um, and as much of a rebel as she was, uh, she was also smart enough to know that um, where she could push limits to get uh, media attention and, um, and success as an artist, as a singer, without, um, you know, doing some things showing her intellect and savvy you know that was part of the, herself that she she kept hidden really to as far as at least to her public i mean all the musicians and all of her good friends who hung out with her that i spoke with you know they all knew that i mean it was clear um but it's just it's tragic that she had to kind of hide that sharp intellect and that savvy you know now she you know that that's kind of a general statement i mean she definitely let it out to you know dick cavett who dick cavett was kind of for the younger folk out there he was kind of the stephen colbert of you know the 60s you know very very smart um well-read uh late show talk show host who you know gave amazing, did amazing interviews with the people on his program. And so, and he and Janice completely clicked and she, and he, you know, she would let that side of herself show with him. And then of course she would kind of say these offhanded, um, you know, like things to like kick herself back down again. But overall, you know, you could definitely see the glimmers of that. And I guess even as a kid, I called, you know, I, kind of picked up on that i think because you know again i mean literally i'm many many years younger than janice <laughs> but um but still even in my day growing up in small town north carolina you know if you were smart you did not want to show people you were smart because that was you know not the popular way to be you know and sadly it was even more so in janice's day so thank god i think that's really changed Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, talk a bit. Uh, let me say, first of all, that, you know, there is a link, uh, you know, that for those of you who are interested and would like to buy a copy of uh, Holly's book, which we encourage, of course. Um, and also, if you have any questions that um, you would uh, like uh, me to ask Holly or have us discuss, uh, you know, please uh, post them in the chat. Um, and, um, but I wanted to ask, you know, there was, again, you know, you alluded to it, um, you know, I wonder if you could just say some more about it. So one of the striking elements of the book uh, is her relationship with her father. 
and um you know that there was this sense in her household of you know like a very conventional set of expectations uh on the other hand there were elements of who her father was that she obviously gravitated toward and internalized and uh you know for for better or worse and, and you know but i wonder if you could talk about that relationship specifically yeah well you know, from a very early age, um, I think she recognized that her father was this kind of outside the box thinker, even though he built boxes for a living. <laughs> he built containers for Texaco Oil Company. He was kind of a middle management kind of guy there. But he would come home and read these hefty tomes on world history and philosophy and listen to classical music and his eyes would well up with tears when he was listening to you know Bach and so I think she early on recognized the value of of those types of things and then you know again as a young girl he started taking her to the library and, you know she quoted there was a quote somewhere she goes in my family as soon as you could write your name you'd get your library card so he really encouraged her own reading and exploring ideas outside um, the mainstream and um also you know she was a real tomboy and she was an only child until she was six. She was 10 when her brother was born. She had a sister that came along when she was six. But I think her, I mean, her dad took her with him to the barber shop and the barber would trim her bangs. And she really was into roughhousing and um, he built her these crazy, you know, devices out in the, you know, these, um, playground type uh, equipment that were quite dangerous in the backyard. And, you know, she, was very outdoorsy, um, rough and tumble kind of gal. So all these kind of things were um, shown to her by her father. And then also her father um, really taught her to speak her mind. So they would have dinner table discussions where she would be allowed to pipe up and say something that maybe in, you know, other households would be like, honey, hush your mouth, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And so the problems came out though when she this way she had developed you know was not accepted by the time she was a teenager and in high school and her outspokenness and the fact that she stood up against um segregation and this was a you know a very fraught period in texas in the 50s when pe you know even though brown versus the board of education um had put put down segregation it was segregation was still the facts for you know another 10 years in texas you know in reality and so because of her outspokenness about things like that which again had been encouraged at home she became just this pariah at school and also um i think their father really taught her fearlessness too, along with that. Now, the bad side of all this was um, her father was also quite a nihilist and um, he had this expression, the Saturday night swindle. And, you know, of course, again, she was, come, you know, this was the Eisenhower fifties, you know, but um, one day when Janice had actually moved to San Francisco the first time when she was 20 and tried to make it as a blues singer in the North Beach coffee houses and Marin County places, you know, back in the folk era, um, and was really getting addicted to speed and drinking heavily and really in a bad way. And her father went out to check on her and she was saying like, dad, you always said things were going to get better. And, you know, once I get to be in my twenties, you know, I'll find myself and things are going to be great. And they're not, you know, and he said, oh, honey, let me tell you about the Saturday night swindle. And so basically it's this idea that, you know, Saturday night, you're going to go out and have fun and kick up your heels and have a great time. And well, in reality, the next day you feel like crap. You've got a hangover. You got to go back to work the next day. And it all the drudgery all starts again and nothing ever really gets any better. You never really get to the promised land on this earth at least and um so you got to just face up you know basically life sucks you know and so so that you know she really did take that lesson to, to heart and um 
she came up with this whole idea of the cosmic blues spelled of course k-o-z-m-i-c and wrote one of my favorite favorite songs that she wrote cosmic blues which is on the album i got them all cosmic blues again mama and basically it's it acknowledges uh the truth of you know life is difficult and hard and misery and for every step forward there's two steps back and <laughs> some, you know, a lot of hard lessons we've all had to learn. And, um, you know, when you're in your 20s still, and again, keeping in mind how young she was, you know, that's kind of a, a bucket of cold water in the face. So she always kind of waited for the, the you know, next, uh, the shoe to drop, next shoe to drop or whatever, with all of her success and fame, um, with, you know, her singing career, she was always had this at the back of her mind, like it's going to, you know, it's all going to come falling apart and it's all going to come tumbling down. Yeah. That, that sort of nihilism, as you put it, that she kind of got from her father was, the obviously the very the negative part of her, you know, inheritance from him while all those other kind of more artistic, uh, elements were with a really, really positive side. Yeah. Well, we do have a question from uh, a Penn alum and former student named Dan Sheehan, um, who uh, characteristically asks a, a very musicological question. Uh -oh. How far back did Janice go in her research of the blues? Oh. Was she listening to Charlie Patton, Blind Lemon Je Jefferson? Was she attracted to Texas blues artists like Lightning Hopkins? Um, she liked a wide range of blues artists. Um, I think the ones that really spoke to her, um, the mo I mean, she had a wide ranging love of the blues and sought out lots of different styles of blues, both uh, the, you know, Delta blues and also, um, you know, more urban blues. But what really got to her, I think, uh, the most was first was Lead Belly, who was from, you know, Texas, Louisiana area, kind of back and forth between those two states. So um, the Lead Belly records that she got really turned her head around. That was the first big one for her. And then um, after that, it was Bessie Smith, which she really became obsessed with Bessie Smith records, because I think uh, the lyrics to Bessie Smith's songs and the way uh, her tonality, the way she used both um, kind of a fearlessness in her singing approach, but also you could hear the pain and suffering too. I think that had a huge effect on Janice. But I mean, she, you know, she discovered everyone from like, say, Lonnie Johnson, and she was discerning. She's like, well, I like Lonnie Johnson's version of Carol's Love better than Lead Belly's, you know, whatever. She would listen to all this kind of stuff and and make decisions on which were her favorites. Um, she loved Ma Rainey as well. She used to cover in her shows beginning in 62 when she was in a little group called the Waller Creek Boys, who were a couple of guys um, in Austin who were mainly doing kind of uh, folk music, um, a lot of Woody Guthrie and stuff like that. She introduced them to a lot of blues songs and started um, adding blues to the repertoire. So with, beginning in those days, she did a lot of, um, you know, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, Lonnie Johnson, Lead Belly. And some of those artists work she would continue to do when she moved to San Francisco in 63 to try to make it as a blues singer. And then she started writing her own blues songs inspired by some of those as artists as well. Oh, we have another uh, question. Um, oh, we could, I think, handle this pretty quickly, which is, uh, it's uh, out of order, but uh, Sue Rutson asks, uh, did Janice have any interaction with Lou Reed? And uh, not that I'm aware of. I mean, yeah, did I was going, you know, I love all these little weird um, synchronicities. So they, the closest I could find uh, was this, that the Velvet Underground, believe it or not, um, had a residency in Chicago this, around the same time that um, that Big Brother and the Holding Company did at this place called Mother Blues in 1966. So I couldn't help but wonder, like, oh, did he pop his head in the door? Does she, you know? And but I found no evidence of that. And then the other uh, thing was, and I again, I found no evidence that Janice attended. But some of her bandmates did go see um, Big Brother and the Holding Company. I mean, I'm sorry, from Big Brother and the Holding Company, did go see the Velvet Underground when they played San Francisco um, around the same period. So they, yeah. So they went to that gig. 
So I was not able to find out if Janice herself did. And I never found, you know, any writings that, you know, where she mentioned it or any interviews or anything. Well, we have a question from C. Ross who asks, um, in saying Janice was ambitious and in the driver's seat of her career, are you aware if her goals were more immediate, next step only, or did she have a long view of where she wanted to take her life? Oh, she definitely had both. Um, and in fact, after the um, book was finished, you know, I still continue to find things like, oh, I wish I would have known this. In fact, I was able to sneak a few things into the paperback edition that came out just a couple of months ago. But um, I found this amazing interview that's been digitized uh, that she did with uh, Studs Terkel for his Chicago radio show um, back in, I think she did it in 68. And she was talking about the long view of what she wanted to do with her singing and how she wanted to uh, develop more nuance with her singing. And she actually, in that interview, you can find it on YouTube. She talks about some of her blues idols. Of course, you know, Studs Terkel was a big blues and jazz fan. They talked about Billy, you know, Holiday, of course. And Janice was like, oh, I'd give anything to be able to sing with that kind of nuanced timing that she does. I don't have that. I'd love to work towards that. And again, I think um, with the long view is why she did switch up her musical aggregations, as I mentioned earlier when we were talking. And, you know, I have all kinds of ideas of what she would have done just based on some of the steps that she was taking as far as the music she was listening to, um, the work, you know, her cover of uh, me and Bobby McGee and her love of Chris Christopherson's music, for example, I think her future in her future would have been a, an album of all that kind of um, cosmic country, you know, poetic Dylan-esque country type stuff that Christofferson was writing. I think, you know, she loved Nina Simone. I, I And Nina Simone surprisingly actually appreciated Janice. Uh, she did not appreciate a lot of, you know, artists, but she did like Janice and, uh, called her out a few times and I could see her eventually doing kind of a Nina Simone inspired piano record at some point, you know? So I think the long view was that she was going to keep working towards uh, just working on her singing. In fact, there's a quote I have in my book in this discussion she had with Paul Rothschild that unfortunately I did not get to interview him. He had already died when I did the book, but I was able to get my hands on some interviews that he had done, you know, years ago. And they had a whole discussion about, you know, Janice, where do you want to be when you're 50? And she had all these ideas. But interestingly, it still went back to Bessie Smith. She wanted to be as excellent of a blues singer as, as Bessie Smith was. So, so she was about 27 when she said that. Well, look, you know, we've got time for maybe one more question, um, which I will just kind of like leave to you. I mean, if, if there's, you know, just one sort of aspect of Janice that, you know, maybe you feel is underappreciated or um, an element of, of um, you know, a kind of your experience of her that, uh, you know, through, you, through writing about her in such depth and all the research that you've done, you know, that you would, you would like people to know as a, as a kind of little farewell here. Well, again, I, I think I have to go back to how multifaceted she was that, um, she, you know, as a musician, she was so developed in so many different aspects of um, musicianship from being this incredible live performer, you know, a, a quite good songwriter, of course, her vocals, you know, her ability to sing, I mean, she could sing anything. We And, and again, we only just got the tip of the iceberg because she could use her voice in so many different ways. Um, she could sing like Joan Baez, believe it or not, if she wanted to. Um, but then also her technical prowess and what a great engineer and producer, you know, she was working towards becoming. And I think, uh, again, you know, women have been so pigeonholed as far as uh, their musicianship and the way they've been uh, represented over the years that um, to see someone like Janis Joplin, who, you know, died 50, you know, one years ago, um, that she was doing all these things that only just now women are starting to get more credit and more um, opportunities to pursue. You know, I, I think that I just can't talk about that enough, really. Well, Holly, it was such a pleasure uh, to to you know be able to engage you on uh, on this 
subject, which is so rich. I mean, we could uh, continue talking about it for another hour for sure. But thanks for making the time. You know, um, Holly's book is Janice, Her Life in Music. Uh, you know, please go check it out. And, and Holly, thank you again. Uh, and of course, it's such a pleasure to see you, um, hopefully. Thank you. Oh, can I just throw in one final last little, since this is a pen um, symposium, um, uh, Big Brother and the Holding Company, their first ever gig on the East Coast was um, at Penn. Oh, really? Wow. At, how do you pronounce it? It's the Palestra. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was their first ever East Coast gig in February 1968. Wow, February. I have to look up the date. It might have been, this might be the anniversary right now as we speak. But anyway, just wanted to say that. <laughs> that's incredible. Well, that, I mean, that's a that's a great link. I mean, I mean, if only we were there in person. But, uh, you know, for those of you who are in Philadelphia, the next time you pass the palestra. Think of Janice. That's a thought. Railing in there. <laughs> All right. Holly, thank you so much again. And thanks for uh, having me. Time in person. Good to see you, Anthony. And, and thanks, thank everybody, you. for tuning in. For tuning in. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be doing more down the line. Okay. Oh, wait. Can I just say one quick thing? Yeah. yeah. I have to give a shout because somebody wanted to know about Lucinda. I just did want to give Lucinda Williams a shout out. Yes, I've had many conversations with Lucinda about Janice. And in fact, that I referenced in my reading uh, this song that she wrote called Port Arthur. And I was actually there literally when she wrote that song um, in back in 2009 in Cleveland. And she literally finished writing it right before going on stage and to sing it on this tribute show to Janice's music that included everyone from her to Susan Tedeschi to Rocky Erickson to Bobby Newarth. It was an incredible show. But anyway, um, many times uh, Lucinda has talked about how much she loves Janice and how inspirational Janice, again, Lucinda being someone who grew up discovering the blues and it changed her life and singing the blues. and. I think that was, you know, yet another uh, common uh, bond that she shared with Janice's influence. So. And indeed, once again, just a couple of years ago, we had uh, Lucinda. I brought her down to Penn and she was doing exactly what you were doing, except in person. Yeah. Um, so there we are. Uh, yeah. Holly, thank you again so much and uh, take care. Hope to see Bye, you. Anthony. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.